So, so by way of announcements, we get started. Reminders that next week on Wednesday, there's a homework due that's submitted on Canvas. It's relatively short, um, and you need to submit it by 1.30. So even if your discussion section and class time for that day is 8.30 p.m., uh, you still need to submit homework by 1.30. Um, the discussion section, um, about a third or so of the class, is going to be uh, uh, doing discussions at 1.30. Like five or six people here. The rest of the people who have 1.30 times are in various rooms, mostly at the University Center. Um, so if you have an 8.30 p.m. time, then they're sort of scattered wherever I can find groups around campus. Um, they, if you don't know where and when you're supposed to be going to class on Wednesday, then you really need to make sure you figure that out as soon as possible. Where uh, are So on Canvas, under announcements, you will find uh, a link to a Google spreadsheet. Um, it's it's uh, an announcement from maybe like four days ago or something. So it's one of the more recent ones. Yeah, sure. What is the discussion? Ah, yes, so it is going to be about, I mean, so it's, 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 it's sort of said on the syllabus, but it's, it's really we're moving into a discussion of the relationship between genetics and cancer. Um, and, so it, and so it's going to be a discussion about genetics and cancer. In terms of preparation to go, um, really you just sort of need to be staying on top of what I'm talking about uh, today and Monday, uh, and uh, and the topics guide that's posted for the quiz is also kind of a guide to sort of help you kind of get there for the discussion time. Um, but so in, during the discussion time, um, what's going to happen when you get there is so so there's going to be um, a student facilitator um, in the room, uh, and they the first thing is there's a quiz. Um, uh, about some of the stuff that's from the topics guide that's posted. posted. After you finish with the quiz, which should take about five or six minutes, then you'll move into a discussion time where um, they're going to kind of review some of the concepts from this unit with everybody um, and then discuss some sort of extensions on those concepts um, and, uh, and give you an opportunity to, um, to work through some challenge questions. So, um, and um, so, the discussion leaders will be um, uh, telling me sort of like what was discussed in the discussion section. They also are going to be telling me, so this is participation counts. Um, you don't have to be the most vocal person, you don't have to be talking all the time, um, but uh, uh, you know, you should uh, two or three times at least, ideally a lot more during the discussion, um, you'll be talking. Um, the goal or sort of the ideal for the discussion sections is that the facilitators actually talk as little as possible, they'll sort of pose questions, and then you'll work through them together, and if you get stuck, they'll help you. Um, but it's really the, the, the whole idea here is to give you an opportunity to work in a small group with some help on some challenge problems associated with the topics that we're currently going on. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that? Okay, um, and so yeah, there's a quiz at the start of the discussion. Look at the topics guide, so be ready for that. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, I wanted to, to kind of take some time today, um, uh, probably most of the class period today, to um, review some of the things, some of the, the core concepts that um, I introduced on Monday, um, and, uh, and especially uh, there were a couple questions on the quiz. Um, that it seemed like people struggled with a little bit, and I wanted to make sure that um, people have sort of a firm foundation of this. Because um, uh, really this is like kind of a central topic for this unit. Um, before we get into the, sorry, there's a lot of talking. Are there questions that people have like questions about? I hear a lot of voices. Okay, so yeah, just you know, raise your hand if you have a question. I'm happy to, to, to help you. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, but uh, as we move into the cancer stuff, um, I want to make sure everyone has a firm foundation on the genetics aspect before we start moving into cancer and the genetics of cancer. Um, and so, uh, and so the, the, the first is um, this sort of Mendelian idea of dominant and recessive from the perspective of an organism. Um, and this is 
these, you know, capital A, little a genes and Punnett squares and um, one copy of the dominant allele means that you express the trait. Um, uh, two copies of the recessive allele means you don't express the dominant trait and you instead express a sort of default recessive trait. Um, if you have one or two copies of the dominant allele, it doesn't matter. Um, there are cases that we talked about already. There's sort of one example that we gave with, um, uh, with uh, um, uh, the flower colors, some of the uh, different flower colors, where it, uh, it matters whether you're heterozygous or homozygous for the dominant allele. Um, the, the heterozygotes have sort of an intermediate color. Um, and that has to do with, on a sort of cellular level, um, if one copy of the gene is sufficient to saturate your cells with red pigment, then two copies of the gene, you're not getting any more red. Um, or if one copy of the gene is sufficient to metabolize all the glucose you need to metabolize, then an extra copy isn't going to, to really affect things so much, um, uh, an extra functional copy. Um, and in that sense, um, being homozygous for the dominant can be, in a sense, sort of protection against loss. That's one of the advantages of being diploid, um, is that if there's some critical protein that my cells need to make, um, and some random x-ray somewhere or something hits, um, uh, hits a, base, uh, a base in my DNA, creates a nonsense mutation that stops uh, the, the protein production off of mRNAs that are made, um, so that I'm no longer making phosphofructokinase, which is this critical enzyme for glycolysis, then um, I still can do glycolysis because the other copy that I got from my dad is fine, even though the copy that I got from my mom got accidentally hit by an x-ray. And, 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 uh, and yeah. so, um, so that, and that's sort of on the, on the organism level, the way we sort of think about dominant and recessive. Um, one thing that I did want to mention as well, um, which uh, was something that people, there, there's one question on the quiz, I think I can reproduce it here, it was like this. Um, for some trait, I said, okay, so is this trait that we're paying attention to, um, there were uh, X-linked dominant, autosomal dominant, uh, re uh, X-linked recessive, autosomal recessive. Um, uh, you can, whether you're not marked X, uh, well, so, so in this case, X-linked X -link dominant is basically always wrong, and in this case, it's sort of especially wrong, so you did lose points if you marked X-linked dominant. Um, there are so, it, it can be very hard in a short pedigree um, to distinguish whether something's X-linked dominant or um, uh, or autosomal dominant, which is why we're sort of not doing X-linked dominant really in this class. Um, but um, first of all, just sort of like at a quick glance, to me this pedigree is obviously recessive. And the reason this pedigree is obviously recessive is that the only way, so we try to imagine if it were dominant, then this person has to have at least one big A. Um, and so they had to have gotten it from somewhere. And so as long as we've got the parentage right here, um, they, mom didn't have it, dad didn't have a big A, so there's no way they could have gotten this big A. Um, and so dominant just doesn't work for this. Whether it's X-linked or autosomal, there's no way that either parent could have passed that on to the child. Um, the, the, the linkage, the X-link versus autosomal, gets a little bit more subtle. Um, but the critical thing to keep in mind here is that men ha males have only one X. So they have an X and a Y. And so on that X, we sometimes when we're, when we're keeping track of a, uh, the chromosome that a gene is on, we'll have the chromosome and then a little s script like this for, for the gene. Um, so um, if this is autosomal dominant, uh, sorry, if this is um, um, X, so we ruled out dominant. Now we're like, okay, well maybe it's X-linked recessive. Well, dad doesn't have the trait, so he must have the dominant allele because we're looking, we're looking for the recessive phenotype. Um, and mom doesn't have the trait, so she needs at least one. And if it's in the family at all, the only place it could be hiding is on mom's other X chromosome. Um, and in that case, it would be possible for her son, for the son to get it. But um, the daughter gets, gets dad's only X and one or the other of mom's X's. And so for sure, she's getting this from dad. 
and then she's getting something, we're not sure which, from mom. But if it's recessive, then she's not going to be expressing the traits. So this doesn't work. We sort of run into a place where we've reached a contradiction, where um, if we say that the, the, the trait is exhibited only in, with recessive alleles, then, um, then we find that we can't get away for that female to have the trait. Um, one way that this is sometimes described is, so, so for example, here, um, so, um, if we had a different pedigree, if we had a different pedigree like this, this does work, right? So maybe this boy got moms, and then this girl gets, we're not sure if she's a carrier or not, depending on which X she randomly got from mom, um, but she doesn't have the trait. The boy does because his only X chromosome has this has this um, non-functioning allele, and therefore he's not producing um, red pigment in his eyes to be able to see the color red. Or he's um, uh, or he's um, there's some uh, 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 he's not he's not making uh, certain factors that are necessary for blood clotting, and so he's a hemophilia or whatever. There are a variety of these different X and recessive traits out there. Um, so so that one does work, um, but. So, so one, one way that we sometimes talk about this is, um, is to say that um, there's sort of synonymous terms, which is heterozygote, zygote, and carrier. So carrier, so in this case, mom is a carrier. Um, if we're dealing with Back over here, the only possibility is that this is an um, uh, this is an autosomal chromosome. Mom's a carrier. An autosomal chromosome. Dad's a carrier, and then then so she ends up little a little a down here, and then this one, this boy, is. We're not sure. He, he might have gotten both dominant alleles. He might have gotten one dominant or recessive. Um, so here, you know, we say, okay, so for autosomal traits, we can have mom or dad being carriers, right? Carrier means heterozygote. Um, but for X-linked traits, there are no such things as a ma as males who are carriers. Because the carrier means heterozygote, and males only have one X chromosome. There's exceptions like Kleinfelter syndrome and stuff, um, uh, which I'd be happy to talk about with people if you're curious. Um, but, but um, for you know, sort of with, with the sort of standard common two X's for a female X and Y for a male, there's no such thing as a carrier male um, for an X-linked trait. Is another way to sort of think about this issue. Yeah. So what questions do people have about that? Okay. Um, all right, so that's the sort of organism's perspective on dominant and recessive. There's also, I sort of mentioned this a second ago in, in the last class period, but there's also uh, a perspective on dominant and recessive. It's um, something at the sort of cellu cellular um, and, and biochemical level. Um, and at the cellular and biochemical level, um, ignoring for a moment um, uh, incomplete dominance where the amount matters, um, although this still really holds true, it's just that the function of protein doesn't make enough to fully saturate the system. So I guess it even, it even works here. Um, but so anyway, uh, dominant equals. Um, functional protein gets made, so the, it, the DNA gets transcribed into an mRNA and it gets spliced and then it exits the nucleus, five prime cap and all that business, and then it gets translated into a protein and ultimately we get a protein that does something. That's a dominant allele. Um, and so that protein can accomplish some biochemistry in the cell. It can, you know, uh, catalyze some some step in glycolysis or make some pigment or whatever. Um, 
a recessive allele is non-functional. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that's sort of the cell's perspective. And it's very, it's very much related to the organism's perspective. Because, um, for example, you know, if I want to be able to have my blood clot appropriately, um, then I need to have a functioning version of the gene that codes for protein that helps my blood clot. Um, and so this boy might end up being a hemophiliac because his mom is a carrier for hemophilia. Um, if I want to, um, uh, if I if I want to um, uh, be able to metabolize um, phenylalanine appropriately, then I need to have uh, uh, a working copy of the enzyme that that metabolizes phenylalanine. And so this, this uh, girl here might have phenylketoluria, which is a disease where you're unable to metabolize phenylalanine appropriately, because neither mom nor dad gave her a working copy of that gene. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, then there's sort of the, the so, then we start to run into the things that, that get to be challenging and, and things that uh, a lot of people seem to seem to sort of get stuck on. Um, which is that dominant does not equal common. Sometimes it does. But telling you whether something's a dominant or a recessive allele is not giving you really any information at all about whether it's common or like barely a little. Um, I mean, so if, if the, we'll talk about this in the next year when we talk about evolution a little bit, but if the frequency of alleles is the same across the population, so if little a and big A are equally common, then you'll have more dominant than recessive. Um, that's actually what we get with, um, with the phenothiocarbamide. Um, who could taste this stuff, by the way? I forgot to take a poll of that. Who could taste this stuff? Any who couldn't? Yeah, so, so yeah. Pretty, pretty, it was, so about 75% of the class could taste it. About 25 could. It turns out that, um, Generally speaking, in the population, the allele for being able to taste is as common as the uh, as the allele for not being able to taste. And since you can, there's sort of three ways you can be a taster, which is if you got um, t uh, work, uh, uh, dominant alleles from both parents, just a dominant from mom, or just a dominant from dad, then uh, in one way to be a non-taster, which is um, which is recessive alleles from both parents, three fourths of the population ends up being uh, tasters um, because. There are exceptions to that, which we might get into a little bit with the evolution. If people started, you know, only dating people who could taste or not the same as them, then we would start to get segregation about that. Um, um, uh, but um, so, so you know, you can bring those on your dates with you and test and see. If you're so anyway, um, but. Um, dominant doesn't equal common. There are a lot of great examples of this. Uh, when's the last time anyone ate a yellow pea? Like yep, yeah, like peas, little green, little green things you eat at dinner. <laughs> no, sorry, not yellow urine. Um, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so if I had if I had a bag of frozen peas and there was a yellow one in there, I'd throw it out. Um, even though I kind of know that yellow is a natural variant or whatever, um, we've all all of the peas we grow are green. They're all carrying two copies of this recessive allele, not chewing up the chlorophyll in the peas because that's what we find more appetizing. Um, uh, um, another example uh, in humans is um, uh, um, having six fingers is a dominant trait. Um, so and yet most people do not have six fingers. Um, a more severe example in humans is um, uh, is um, Huntington's disease. This is a dominant trait. Um, it affects about one out of uh, somewhere between ten and fifty thousand people. Um, I hope that nobody in here either has Huntington's disease or has a relative with it. It's a pretty um, severe um, uh, 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 developmental neurodegenerative, actually not developmental neurodegenerative disease as you get into adulthood. Um, one of the reasons it persists in the population is that people get past childbearing age before they develop symptoms. 
Um, but, uh, um, but it's still rare, even though it's dominant. Um, so dominant doesn't mean doesn't mean common, and recessive doesn't mean rare. Um, so you know, I mean, five fingers is a recessive trait, but uh, most people have that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if they're on a study, I'm not sure. If they, if they appear on a study guide, then there'll be a short list of like, of like different diseases. Color, probably color blindness and Huntington's uh, are good ones to memorize. Um, and um, ex, uh, 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 color blindness is Huntington's actually. Yeah. And then, um, uh, and then I guess phenyl ketoneuria I'll put up on this because I just mentioned it before. So we have one of each. Yeah. Um, they, 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 you should remember it's excellent. I'll put that on a study guide. You won't, you won't need that for the quiz on Wednesday, but for the exam. Um, yeah. So um, Huntington's disease also sort of illustrates a couple other things about, about um, some subtlety to the cellular um, definition of dominant and recessive. Um, so there's the hunting ton gene, which codes for the hunting 10 protein. If you get those things confused, I promise not to take off points for that. Um, uh, but you should, you know, if you call it the hunting ton protein or whatever, um, I add it fine. But um, the, the hunting 10 protein um, in your neurons. All of us have it. All of us have two copies of it um, and make that protein. Um, the full function is not known, but it helps with, um, uh, it helps with sort of neural development. So the, the, the common allele, the healthy allele, helps with neural development. So, so in that sense, the common allele, the, the, the recessive allele, kind of has a function in that sense. In fact, it, I don't know that this ever happens to humans. We've engineered mice for which this happens. Um, but you could conceive of a human, you could imagine a human with no, work, with no copies at all of the Huntington um, protein. Based on what we've seen with mice, they would have some subtle developmental deficits in neuronal function, but not too severe in terms of symptoms. Um, but there is a function that, that this sort of recessive allele for. And so it's, just, it's like recessive for what? Recessive for the disease. So that gets a little bit confusing. Um, but but the, sort of the reason why it's dominant, the reason why it sort of fits with this, is that the, um, the rare um, mutant allele codes for a protein with a toxic function. So it's a protein that literally forms these toxic clumps that kills neurons in your brain. Um, and that's a function, right? It's not like a good function. It's not something I want proteins in my neurons to be doing. Um, uh, I definitely do not want proteins in my neurons to be doing that, or else I would, um, uh, in the next 10 years or so, start to develop severe motor and cognitive deficits. Um, and so, um, but, so, so that sort of leads to another caveat to this, which is that function, which I can't even spell, doesn't always equal good as well. Um, in the case of the Huntington protein, the mutation introduces a new function that is damaging and toxic. Um, and so, therefore, you can sort of, uh, if X doesn't equal Y and so on and so forth, dom dominant alleles are not always good as well, right? Um, Huntington's disease is sort of the classic example. Um, there aren't a lot of dominant diseases out there because um, from an evolutionary perspective, if there's something that is creates toxicity, like the, the thing that I imagined for the quiz, where one of the enzymes in glycolysis suddenly starts building up cyanide in your cells. If there were ever uh, a, a, an embryo conceived that had that altered function, it would never make it to, to be born. 
um, and never have children of its own. So, a so, so, you know, a lot of the time, the, the functional proteins out there are, are out there because they're doing good things. Um, that's why they persist in the population. Um, but that's not a sort of necessary aspect of the dominant function. Yeah, sure. So, can you kind of um, relate in such a good way? What's more, it would be more significant to the organism having the disease, or just like reducing the mindset like, that that they almost there together? And then how that would relate to other diseases, like in terms of like, the function? I mean, so, so yeah, so, good question. Um, so, if, um, if the loss of a protein is going to kill you, then, then it's recessive lethal is what we call it, which means two missing copies and you're dead. Um, uh, and, you know, the enzyme that we call says a lot of the sort of like core metabolic pathways that we talk about, those are all necessary things for cells to stay alive. And so, um, uh, and so, um, it turns out that for the, the Huntington protein happens to be a protein that has some use, but its use is sort of good enough to keep it around evolutionarily, but kind of by bad luck, it's got this added feature that if it um, gets mutated in a particular way, then it becomes toxic. And the toxicity, for, so, so if a gene is not like necessary for survival, but just sort of helps along, um, then, um, then it's hard to predict um, what's going to happen with that. Um, I, I would say, I guess, I mean, we'll talk, when we get into cancer, which is kind of what's coming up, uh, uh, hopefully we'll start talking about to that today and get into that uh, next time. Um, when we get into cancer, um, it'll sort of become, I try and be a little bit more clear. But the, the short answer to your question is there's no like hard and fast rule about predicting. Um, so necessary proteins where we have biochemi biochemistry that our cells have to do, those are, if you have two non-working copies of that, you're dead. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. So this the, um, how many alleles are just like a randomness of how they're... Um, so, the, uh, I, I would say not so much how many alleles. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, there, are, there are a few cases, there are, few, there, there are a number of cases where there are more than two alleles running around a population. The only one we've talked about is the um, ABO blood types, where there are two dominant functional alleles out there, and each one of them is sufficient to give you type A or type B blood. You have to have both of these for type AB. Um, yeah. Some people ask about um, uh, the AB positive versus negative. There's a whole other gene on a different chromosome that um, codes for if you have a functional version, you get another sugar added on that we call positive. It's called the rhesus factor because it was first identified in rhesus monkeys. The humans have it too. Um, and then if you don't, then we say you're Rh negative. And so like, if you're not, like I'm O positive, which means that I have two non-functional copies of the A slash B alleles, one or more functional copies of the, uh, the, the Rh alleles. Yes. Yeah. You had a question too? Symptoms until later in life? Right. So it's like symptoms. Right. So up until they develop sim symptoms, is that Huntington protein like toxic? Yes. Yeah. So it's an issue of it's sort of a progressive disease. Um, where um, even before they develop symptoms, there are at, at a sort of microscopic level, some neurons are starting to develop this pathology and these clumps of toxic protein in them. Um, and then, um, and then, but but brains are pretty resilient, and um, uh, you know, generally speaking, killing a few neurons here and there doesn't doesn't cause noticeable symptoms. Uh, but you kill enough neurons, and eventually you start to see symptoms. So the pathology starts developing before this doesn't show. Yeah, sure. Um, just a little unclear. Does the the recessive allele, like the more common allele, does that still code for A protein? Yes, it does. Okay. In this case, it does. Um, so and so in this case, I mean. It's almost, maybe even co-dominant would be a better term in a sense, because we have one functional allele which codes for the ability to make, neuro, to make uh, develop neurons in a perfect way. Um, one functional allele that codes for toxicity, and then the possibility, although I don't think it exists anywhere in the human population, of non-functional alleles that just do not. Um, and so maybe, 
Oh, I don't know. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. So, at so some point, the, the, our, 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 our attempts to classify sort of fall apart. But when we're talking about the disease, Huntington's disease is a dominant, tra dominantly transmis tra transmitted disease. Yeah. Um, because that's the added bad function. So then, like, the cure resuscitation you're talking about, like, that, that's similar to what they've done in mice? Yeah. They, they totally yeah, and they, I wouldn't worry about that. Like, to, for this task, we just say Huntington's disease is dominant. Don't worry about what the, what the protein does when it's not being toxic when you're getting it. There were a couple other hands over here. Did you have, yeah. Yeah, Richard, sorry. Um, um. Yeah, so if you're a carrier um, yes. for some sort of disease where it's a recessive trait, is there a way to tell that you're a carrier? Or um, not well. I mean, now with yeah, I mean genetic testing, yes. Like like if you go to twenty three andme or something, yeah, they can they can figure that out. Um, but um, um, but not so much really before that. Okay. Yeah, sure. So it codes for it's sort of like there's 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 like a, a, a Jekyll and Hyde version of it or something. There's like there's like two two versions. I mean, I, yeah. If 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 you sort of just forget what I said a couple minutes ago and imagine the, the the recessive version as coding for nothing, then that'll probably make life easier for you. And if you want to go into the complexity, we can go into the complexity uh, at another time. But uh, but for this class, let's just sort of let's just sort of back up and say the recessive common allele does nothing and we're good to go. And that makes that make that that'll get you everywhere you need to go for, for understanding things. Is it did you have a question also? Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so could you just explain actually from what I, can I explain to you what I think it is? Okay. okay. So for um dominant diseases, um they don't usually work because the person with the disease isn't able to transit the uh, allele on their uh, offspring, right? Yeah, the, it, it, for, for, for a severe dominant disease that manifests early in childhood, that's not going to be, that's not going to persist in a population. Okay, but well, my it can just because it's able to develop, it doesn't develop fully. Yeah, yeah, until you're 40 years old, you don't show symptoms. Okay. And so, and by then most people have had kids. Okay. Um, so, and it's, there's a little bit that goes into that. But, um, I mean, but, yeah, I mean, some, some people, like, they know their parents got it, and then they might either get tested before they decide to have kids now or something, because we have more of an understanding now. But, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, other questions about that? Sure, yeah. Um, what about with, like, sickle cells? Yeah, that's, that's another one where it's sort of hard to fit into these boxes of dominant, recessive, and so on. Um, but, um, it's 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 a pro I sort of think of it as a protein that has multiple functions. Um, so the common allele, which is called the A allele, um, is what uh, is what most people have, and most people are homozygous for. And if you have the A allele, then that's sort of like normal hemoglobin. It's, it's the hemoglobin. Um, if you have the S allele, then one copy of that is basically recessive and happens to add a function, which is that it provides resistance to malaria. Um, this is a case where actually it's possible to tell without getting genetic testing, whether you have the S allele, if you are um, a cornerback uh, um, uh, 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 for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you go play in uh, Mile High Stadium, and collapse on the field for no apparent reason, um, then, um, it, then it may be that you have, that you are a carrier, because at high altitudes in low oxygen environments, people who are carriers for that actually does affect the chemical visibility to transmit oxygen. And so um, uh, Brian Clark, Brian Clark was, uh, had a sickle cell attack playing in Denver, and now he doesn't play in Denver anymore. Um, uh, and, um, uh, so, so, um, but then two copies of it, and you have sickle cell anemia, which is, um, uh, which is one of those things where, um, at that state, very severe shortened lifespan, unlikely to live to childhood. So the disease is recessive, but then one copy carries some changes associated with it, which is called sickle cell trait, or being a carrier, which is 
sort of synonymous in that case. And it's, again, another situation where it just, so it's sort of like the, the, the simple ideas um, get more complicated the more you dig into them. So, yeah. Yeah, great question. Okay, so, all right. So we're gonna make we're gonna make some mutants here, um, and we're gonna make some mutants and um, think back to there. There are various ways that you can alter the genome to make some to make mutations. Um, a a dominant mutation is going to do one of two things. Either increase protein amount, I guess maybe three things. Increase protein amount, um, make the protein expressed in, um, in the wrong cells. Um, or, or maybe not you know, cells that it didn't, or um, create some new function. That function might be good, that function might be making side. Um, so that's our dominant mutation. Um, our recessive mutation is going to um, stop, stop the protein from being a functional protein. And then there's one other kind of mutation that we can have, which is a um, what would be called a conservative mutation, um, because si silent it means something slightly different. Um, although silent mutation falls into the under the category of conservative mutation, mutation. I think there's an extra there. Um, and this is one that doesn't change the protein's expression or function. That's the question. Yeah, so, so, so stop protein function. So one example is an early stop protein would do that. Um, so thinking back, we talked, last unit, um, we talked about, uh, or actually, so sorry, one other thing to add to this, or sort of remind you from last unit. This is a stretch of DNA, where you've got a gene on that DNA. Then you have your... Bless you. <laughs> Quite the sneeze. <laughs> you have your promoter. Promoter proximal elements. Enhancers and so on. All of this. So we can make changes in the gene. Silent mutations. Frame shift mutations, missense mutations, and nonsense mutations. If you can't remember, the missense is when the, so you substitute one amino acid for another, the nonsense is when you put in an early stop. Um, we can also potentially alter, may, maybe mutate the DNA not in the gene itself, but in some of these regulatory sequences. So those are sorts of our tool, that's kind of our toolbox of ways we can mess around with DNA. The question then is which kinds of mutations could lead to a dominant allele being created? Which kinds could lead to a recessive allele being created? And which kinds could lead to a conservative mutation where the protein function doesn't change? Um, and Many of these will, there, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, many of these will fall into some or all of the categories here. Um, so, uh, so there might be, you know, for example, silent mutations as well as um, some sorts of missense mutations can lead to conservative, conservative uh, uh, changes that don't alter protein function. Um, but other kinds of missense mutations might lead to a recessive protein. So try to sort of think about um, 
from what you know about proteins and what you know about about uh, uh, um, about these types of mutations, what is how how are we going to map these onto each other? Um, and we'll have let's have like seven to eight minutes to do that, and I'm going to kind of walk around and see what questions people have as we do that. Um, oh yeah, so before you start, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it has to do with the regulatory rates. Regulatory rates. You have more efficient driving rates.
Nazis turn it in front, you know, she did. Um, and, uh, I think it's a class here. Don't worry about it.